class, which is just absolutely delightful to me. So, so thank you all. Thank you very much. I am delighted to be here. I'm, I'm glad to get the invitation. And, if, and, and um, I really don't know what it is that you all would like to know about our judicial system and what I do, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you have. But before I do that, let me just tell you a little bit um, about Massachusetts and our trial court system, because it's a bit unique. Um, can all of you hear me? Yeah? So, so it's on. I usually don't need a microphone, but um, in any event, uh, Massachusetts is one of I think eleven states that do not elect their judges. So most uh, states across the country elect their uh, judges one form or another, whether they're the appeal appeals court or the trial courts. In Massachusetts, we don't. We're uh, nominated and we're confirmed and appointed in their lifetime appointments. In our trial court system, we have uh, trial courts such as probate that handle um, you know, divorces and wills. We have housing court, um, which obviously deal with evictions and tenancies. Uh, we have land court, which deal with issues specific to, um, to property and real estate and real property. We have our district courts, we have superior court, and then uh, after that we have our, an appeals court and our supreme judicial court, which is also an appellate court. So I'm a member of the superior court. Uh, and in our court, we have uh, 82 judges across the state in 20 courthouses. Uh, and we have general jurisdiction, or concurrent jurisdiction, what's called, with most other courts on most things. So we handle civil and criminal cases. We handle all uh, civil cases that the damages exceed $25,000 or more. Uh, we have all appeals from state agencies. We have all criminal felonies, uh, although typically um, we, have, we have jurisdiction over all crimes, but most of the crimes are felonies for which um, there is state prison term. And we have exclusive jurisdiction over first degree murder cases. So um, I was appointed two years ago, maybe last week or so. And so I've been, I've been on the bench for two years. And the way we do our rotations are uh, we do three months and we do both civil and criminal. And I could be anywhere in the state. I happen to be from Essex County, so this was easy for me. Uh, so I'm typically in Essex County. Um, Usually, and right now I'm in Salem, uh, but I could be out in Worcester, we could be out in, in, uh, in Boston, which is sort of where we're headquartered. Uh, but because there are so few of us sort of north of Boston, uh, even though I'm relatively new to the court, not, not that people don't like coming up this way, but it's inconvenient for them. So it's easy for me to get the rotations, whether they be in Lawrence or Salem, or Newburyport, which is where our three superior courts in, Mass in Essex County uh, reside. So uh, during the months of February and March, we have judicial outreach. And it's been growing over the past few years. We've come to uh, council some aging such as this. We'll go to schools. We'll go anywhere where people you know, want to ask us questions or um, are interested in speaking to us. And then, so that's sort of the tour that we've been on uh, recently. And so when I was called about uh, this group, I was thrilled and delighted. I didn't know exactly what it was, and I'm sure there are a lot of you that have uh, different questions about different things. So no one said come and speak about anything specifically. Uh, but I figured I'd give you a little bit of a background uh, as to how our system runs, in our court in particular, and then just answer whatever questions that you might have. I think that there are a lot of um, People, there are a lot of misunderstanding, I think, about what we do, how we're um, appointed, because we're not elected, uh, and sort of the decisions that we make, especially in criminal cases. You know, because typically, even though we're handling very serious civil matters, you know, medical malpractice cases, or in, in, in our, uh, contract cases, or construction matters, or a whole host of things, discrimination cases, um, the papers typically pick up on the criminal 
cases, which make sense, you know, issues of public safety. So most uh, misconceptions um, arise out of those cases and things that you may or may not read about uh, in the newspaper. So I find that typically people want to ask about criminal matters more than they want to ask about civil matters, but, uh, but I'm happy to answer either of those, those issues. So does anyone have uh, anything? Go ahead. I have a question sure. for you. If you rotate every three months between criminal and civil, how do you bring yourself up to speed when you do that transfer? You guess. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, our rotations are three months, but they're not necessarily, um, you don't necessarily go from cr a criminal rotation to a civil rotation. So when you first start, they stick you s strictly in civil, even if you've had criminal experience. I was lucky. I practiced, my, in my practice, I handled both criminal, criminal and civil cases. So I had some familiarity with both. Oh, thank you. But, um, even those judges who come solely from a criminal background, either criminal defense attorneys or prosecutors, they're still put into a civil session first. And I think that the reason is that uh, it's easier to fix something in a civil case when you screw it up than a criminal case. Because in criminal cases, we're dealing with people's liberty, you know, and we're dealing with public safety, and you're incarcerating people. And you, you know, you, we do our best to get them all right, but. Um, it's easier to start on the civil end because if I were to make a decision that was wrong, they could always bring it back before me. I mean, sure, money matters. In a lot of these cases, really, that's what it's about. And damages matter. But I always have an opportunity to rethink maybe that decision if someone brings something to me that I didn't see or didn't know, uh, and I can always change that. I can certainly change it on a criminal case as well, but someone's been sitting in jail for six months or a, a year. so. Um, so we start that way. And, um, and with respect to the cases, how you, you have to know where to go to get the information because it, what we do is so broad that no matter what you did in civil practice or what your experience is, there's no way you could have handled everything that we see. So um, you have to rely on your own research, on the research of your, um, your research lawyers. And you rely a lot on the, the lawyers, the attorneys that come before you, because they know their cases better than uh, I do. And oftentimes, you're educated by them. So um, that's, and believe me, it's a good question, because I, I can't tell you the number. I just got a, there's a new colleague of mine, and she was just appointed, um, I think, last month. And she's from Essex County as well. And uh, you know, her whole experience was as a prosecutor and then criminal defense work. So they threw in her civil session, you know. Uh, but you get up to speed. Um, we do do a significant amount of um, continuing education and trainings. Uh, we have two judicial seminars a year for our court, which are weekend um, retreats, if you will. And then there are always, there's, a, there's an institute for judicial learning, a flash of institute in, in Worcester. And, um, on varying topics, they have regular um, seminars and, and trainings. So uh, you do your best to keep up and hope you don't screw it up too bad. What, what yeah. happens if you say every three months? What if you're in the middle of a case? That's a good question. So we, um, if I were on trial in a case, um, I would stay, you know, you'd, you'd finish that out before rotating. Um, and we try not to schedule long trials on that last week because we know that people are going to, going to be rotating out. But oftentimes you just have to keep the case sometimes. So, um, and as, as an example, I had handled the case, pretty complicated case when I was in Lawrence in the civil session. And then um, I was over in Salem, I'm over in Salem now sitting criminally. And issues came up on that case, and the judge sitting civilly in Lawrence w wasn't going to be able to hear it because of his docket until April or May. The parties really needed to get in to discuss these issues and resolve them. So I said, send it up to me. I'm familiar with it. I took an afternoon off of my criminal session, and I handled that. So um, you know, we typically don't keep cases 
but uh, it's not uncommon to have lawyers and parties come up to another court, even if it, in a different county, to address uh, a particular case because you may have written a decision on it, or what happens a lot is you make a decision, you move on, and they file uh, motions for you to reconsider that decision. And so then you have to get the file brought over if you're in Middlesex or in Norfolk or whatever it is and hand, hand work there. So that's not uncommon. Yes. Um, two questions. Sure. One is, um, do all your cases go to jury? And uh, the other question is, is about how long does a case usually last? Uh, no, not all cases uh, are jury matters. So at any time, the parties can choose to have uh, the case tried before a judge. Uh, there are certain cases for which you're, you have a statutory right to a jury trial, and there are other cases where you don't. So even, there are some instances where um, a party may want a jury trial, but they may, may not be entitled to a jury trial. So um, you start out, the presumption is always jury, though, it's just the nature of how we do things. And then it depends on the case how long it takes. So. A medical malpractice case may take, you know, two to three weeks. A murder case could take a couple of days or it could take a month. Um, drug cases um, typically don't take too long, a few days. So it, it really, it, it all depends. It depends how complicated the case is. Some cases may, um, be serious, the nature of a criminal charge, for example, it might be kidnapping. But just because the case is very serious doesn't mean it would take long to try. So say uh, there was an alleged kidnapping of um, one person. Uh, and you have that one person testify, perhaps, and you have a police officer testify, that, that might be it. So even though the cases are serious, they don't necessarily have to be long. But usually, uh, and, and, and oftentimes they're longer in the civil session. Like a medical malpractice case, you're talking about a lot of experts, uh, a lot of witnesses. Um, and sometimes it takes longer because on the civil side anyway, we try to do half days of trial. Because even when we're on trial, we still have motion sessions in the afternoon. So there are other cases coming in. So um, sometimes they take a little longer days wise because you're only, you're only going half a day, for example. So it really, it really varies. Um, but usually in Superior Court, I would say the average is about a week. Sure. Anyone have any? Yes, sir. Yes, could you talk about uh, juror service? Sure. What would you like to know about juror service? <laughs> uh, as someone who gets called, what should I, a lot? What should I know? <laughs> Know how to get out of it? Is that what you're going to ask? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, um, juror service. In Massachusetts, you get called for one trial or one day. So, if you, you, don't, if you don't get picked that day, you're going to be released. Um, if you do get picked, it could obviously be a lot longer. Typically, you go in and um, you're going to see a video. Uh, these days, judges address jurors initially. I don't know if that's always been the case, but it's trying to. Um, we try to. When I ha when I'm picking a jury, I like to greet the jurors. So if you've been before, right, you go down to that big jury room. I don't know if you've seen the video or not. They give you a video, right, and you wait around a lot. Um, and there's a reason for that, but you wouldn't necessarily know it. So I don't know if, in your experience, you've had judges come down and meet that jury. Uh, and I like to do it because I, I give some people an example. Uh, well, I tell people why I think it's, it's really important. And, um, you know, I know you're down there and you don't know what's going on and you're waiting around. There's a lot of wasted time. But um, you should know that we realize and appreciate um, that it's difficult on you and your families. It interferes with work schedules. A whole host of things. We get it's an inconvenience. But really, uh, other than voting, and quite frankly, I think it's more important than voting. Because 
the decisions you make as jurors, or we all of them, I have to say, uh, really has an immediate effect and impact on the lives of the people that you're judging. And that's what you're doing, you're judging. You know, I might be the judge of the law, but jurors judge the facts. And it is a system that we inherited from uh, the British common law. And in, in Britain, or in England, in around the 11th century or so, 11th, 12th century, they started moving away from trial by combat and trial by ordeal and started moving towards a jury trial system, at least in the most important or serious uh, matters. It was such an important concept that it was written into most, if not all, of our colonial charters and then subsequently written into our state and federal constitutions. And it's really a egalitarian and democratic concept if you think about it. The idea that if we are charged with a crime by our government, or we have a dispute with a neighbor, we don't want a judge to make the decisions on the facts of those cases. We don't want the government to do it. We want people from our community, our fellow citizens, who have no stake in the outcome and who are presumably unbiased to make those decisions, and we live with them. And I tell people before they go up um, that I am a first generation American. So uh, my parents came over in the early 60s from Cuba. My father was a political prisoner in Cuba. He was rounded up on the streets and thrown in jail. And he would have loved an opportunity to address his grievances with his fellow citizens, and he even never got that opportunity. Um, and so uh, I understand what an inconvenience it is. But you know, today it's somebody else, and tomorrow it might be you or me. Um, and believe it or not, even in those instances where you sit around half the day and then they come in and say, by the way, you're all set, we don't need you, it's because cases that have been scheduled that day to go to trial are resolving. And the reason they're resolving is because they know that there are citizens there ready to hear the case. You know, oftentimes, and I used to do this as a defense attorney when I had criminal cases, you know, you prolong the case as long as you can sometimes, especially if your person is not in custody. You're defending because you know, witnesses forget things, they don't show up, uh, all sorts of reasons. And you push it and you push it. Uh, and sometimes you show up knowing that there's no jury available, it's not going to be heard, there's no incentive for you to resolve the case. But when people are there and they're ready and willing and able to serve, um, all of a sudden the rubber meets the road and you either decide to do something now or you take your chances at trial, which is everyone's right. Uh, but it facilitates cases. Uh, and it happens on the civil side, too. You find cases settling uh, right at the last minute because there are people there waiting. I mean, um, a defendant in a civil case that's going to pay money to a plaintiff who's brought suit is going to hold on to that money as long as he or she can whether that be an individual defendant or an insurance company or whatever. I mean, why would I write a check today if I don't have to write it for another six months or a year? Well, when you're there and you're ready to hear a case, um, they, uh, they tend to settle. Uh, I tell a story uh, just last, I think it was last January, not this past January, but the year prior. I was sitting in Newburyport. And in Newburyport, I don't know if you know this, but we're all Essex County folks. So Newburyport, Superior Court, is the oldest continuous active uh, courthouse in the country. Daniel Webster argued cases there. Uh, and it's still there, and we still hear cases. Um, it's one courtroom upstairs. Uh, it's drafty, you know, uh, but it's great. And, and as a lawyer, I only had a couple of things where I had an appeals case there, case there once, and I, um, and I had a civil matter there once. But, um, but anyway, I, I do like sitting there. So, I came down to greet the jurors, and in Salem, you know, we have this large judicial complex, right, with all sorts of courts in there, and we take turns going down and greeting jurors, but in Newburyport, you're the only person there. So I went down to greet jurors, and seated in, you know, the, the jury seats, just like you would be, was Associate Justice David Lowy. Now, Justice David Lowy is a, an associate, associate Justice of the Su, uh, Supreme Judicial Court. That's our highest court. Um, and he is an Essex County uh, person as well. So he's sitting there in the jury pool. Interestingly enough, our seats on the Superior Court are all numbered. I couldn't even tell you what number 
I am. But the, our seats were uh, commissioned by the legislature. So you know, whatever number it was. And when you are inducted into the Superior Court, uh, there's a ceremony and the, the, the Chief Justice um, gives a history of the seat that you're now going to occupy. And in my particular case, there were three judges prior uh, to my taking the seat. Um, the first two, I can't even remember the names, I couldn't even tell. Although one did go to the appeals court. But the last judge to hold the seat before I got it was Justice David Lowy, who was appointed to the Supreme Judicial Court. His seat became vacant, and, um, and they appointed me to that seat. So, in any way, we're in this uh, jury room, and I give my spiel, you know, just like I do to every potential juror. And would you know that he came upstairs, he was selected to sit on that jury until four o'clock that afternoon when the last lawyer with his last challenge knocked him off, um, off, the, uh, off the jury. So he was there ready, willing, and able to serve just like we all have to. Um, and, I'm, and I'm glad, quite frankly, because I, was, I didn't want my case to go up on appeal, you know. He'd probably have to recuse himself in any of it. But, uh, but he was there, and he spent the whole day. And, and uh, so everyone has to do it. Um, but I am also pretty sensitive to people's hardships. I think some judges, um, I don't know. We, there's a, we all have different levels of tolerance um, for people's nonsense. Um, and uh, oftentimes, you, might, you can tell if someone's really just saying anything they can just to get off jury service. That doesn't sit all that well. But I'm, I'm particularly sensitive to people who are self-employed, who are hourly earners, you know, who have um, you know, child care issues, single parents, that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm pretty lenient, I think, in that respect with letting people off of jury service for hardship. Um, I find that if you let them off pretty quickly, I mean, you, you, you just get a jury more quickly. I mean, we, these, a lot of times folks that you let off are not going to be able to sit anyway. It, it makes no sense to spend 15 or 20 minutes trying to convince someone. Um, and there are other reasons why people won't sit either. You know, we want people who are unbiased, you know, who have no prejudice, who can, um, even accepting their own life experiences, follow instructions and follow the law. And you know, and sometimes the case might involve a, um, a police officer. Um, vitally important to that particular case. And you know, people say, look at my, I have four, three uncles are all police officers, my dad is a police officer, I'll do my best, you know, uh, because one of the questions I always ask is, would you tend to believe the testimony of a law enforcement official more than you would anyone else just because they happen to be in law enforcement? Mm -hmm. And some people say, well, you know, I'd like to say no, but you know, everyone in my family is in law enforcement. And I see what they go, you know, and it'd be hard. I, I'd try. Well, I appreciate that honesty, but that person isn't right for this trip. Uh, sometimes you have terrible sexual assault cases where jurors come up and uh, for the first time they disclose abuse that's occurred to them right there um, for the first time when asked about it while sitting, you know, while, while picking a juror. So um, it's an interesting process. Uh, I know, like I said, I know it's inconvenient like that. But you know what? The fa actually, my favorite part of this job is speaking to jurors after they served. Yeah. So as a lawyer, I never had that opportunity. Massachusetts is it's odd in a lot, a lot of ways. But um, in one way that it's a little different than other places is that, at least when I was practicing, we're not allowed to speak to jurors. Now that's changed in the past several years. So now on motion, you know, people can um, try to communicate with jurors and it's done more frequently. But, but when I was practicing, it was never done. I never got the chance to speak to jurors. Uh, and it's great now. I find that most people appreciate the service. They're happy they did it. Um, that do it again. I mean, they're not rushing up to the courthouse steps to do it, you know, next week. But uh, but they really appreciate it, and they get a, a real sense of what the process is like. And I think they go away with a, 
and appreciation, and more importantly than that, they go away with the understanding that they've done something very valuable. Uh, and I, I can't speak to other courts. Um, every case is serious, uh, and every case is important to the litigants, however small it might appear to us. But at least in the Superior Court, we are dealing with really serious things. And so I think that when people serve on juries for you know, an alleged rape, an alleged murder, uh, an armed robbery, a medical malpractice case, I think when they leave there, um, they feel like they've accomplished something, they've something, something really worthwhile. And again, those decisions have immediate effects on our fellow citizens. So um, that's probably the, I mean, that's probably the best part of this job for me. Uh, and I didn't think, I didn't even realize it would be um, until I, I started doing it. But speaking to jurors afterwards is great, it really is. Yes, sir. <coughs> Isn't there an age limit on, on juries? Yes, well, no, there's no age limit, but if you're 70 years old, you don't have to serve. Um, but what's interesting is that most people, uh, those aren't the people that are looking to, you know, begging to get off, quite frankly. Um, it's an option, but I find that most um, people 70 or over that show up uh, believe it's their civic responsibility and duty. They're happy to be there. Um, and, um, and, and I don't get many requests for that. I'm sorry? It's true. Yeah. That's part of it. Um, but sometimes, um, you know, someone might come in with a disability, might make it difficult, and I'll tell them, you know, you're not, you're not obligated to serve under the law, uh, but certainly I would never exclude someone because they're 70 or older. Yeah. Yes? I'm going to ask another question. Sure. Um, have you ever been sitting on a case and in your mind you've decided innocent or guilty and the jury doesn't agree with what your mind is saying. Has that happened to you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that's not my job or role or responsibility. Yeah, I know. You can't say it. Um, well, I mean, look, the, the truth is if something were so outrageous, I can throw in a jury verdict. It is something that is not done very often. It would have to be unusual circumstances. Um, but it could happen, you know, it, and it does happen. Um, but the issue isn't whether I could find that the Commonwealth uh, proved someone guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. It's whether any reasonable jury, any reasonable trier of fact. So the truth is that I may feel one way, a jury may feel another way, and another jury might feel another way. It happens all the time where uh, we have um, mistrials because a jury cannot come to a verdict. Our verdicts in criminal cases have to be unanimous. Um, a jury can't come to a verdict, so they have to retry the case. Another jury might find that person guilty or innocent or not guilty. Uh, so that does that does happen. That happens a lot, actually. Yeah. Um, today there's a lot of uh, discussion about sentencing. Yes. What is the policy for Massachusetts courts for the judge to sentence a guilty party? Sure. We have a tremendous amount of discretion in sentencing. Now, having said that, there are certain cases uh, in which there are minimum mandatory sentences. The legislature has seen fit that, for example, trafficking in cocaine, trafficking in fentanyl, um, mandates a minimum mandatory sentence. There are other cases that have uh, a maximum penalty. Um, so let me think. So I think uh, armed robbery, for example, I think, has up to 20 years in state prison. Now, up to 20 years in state prison. And the way we sentence, by the way, we have, with respect to jails, there are two options. There's House of Corrections, which is like a Middleton House of Correction, right? County jail or state prison. There are some offenses for which you can only get misdemeanors. You can only get House of Correction sentences. There are offenses for which you can only get state prison sentences. Uh, armed robbery, for example. And then there are certain charges for which you can, there are both a state prison term, and in the alternative, you could sentence someone to county 
J. Now, with the minimum mandatory sentences, I have no discretion. So if someone is convicted today uh, of trafficking in a class B substance, cocaine, for example, uh, and trafficking by its nature has to be the selling of over 10 grams, you know, possession with the intent to distribute over 10 grams, I must sentence to at least three and a half years in state prison. On cases like rape, which is up to life in prison, I could give life, I could give probation. That's a big difference. Right? So we do have a lot of discretion. Now we do have what are called sentencing guidelines. But those are not mandatory. Um, and those of us who have done this for a while, I mean, we look at them, um, and what they do is, they slot people in for the type of offense and prior record and age and that sort of thing. And, but the truth is that sentencing isn't cookie cutter. And, and those guidelines don't take into account a whole host of different things. Someone's upbringing, someone's mental illness. Um, you know, it just doesn't, uh, it doesn't take into account everything. But it's there to help. It's, it's one tool. So, um, so we have a lot of discretion in sentencing. And remember, our sentencing, and, and you may have heard about um, federally, um, I think the president just signed recently a, um, a criminal reform bill, right? But that's on the federal side. So those are federal sentences, which have nothing to do with anything that we do. Governor Baker, I think um, in April, signed a new criminal reform bill in Massachusetts that, uh, for example, trafficking in fentanyl, until April of last year, did not carry a minimum mandatory sentence. So you could sentence up to whatever, 10 years, but, uh, but you could also give them less than what you can now, which, what you have to impose now, which is a minimum mandatory sentence. So, um, so there's a lot of discretion. And it varies greatly, and it's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, I currently am in the first session in Salem. And what the first session means, that's, a, that's an arraignment session. So it's sort of the first place people come once they've been indicted or charged in the Superior Court. So we see a lot of bails and bail requests. We see a lot of hearings to detain people on dangerousness. We see a lot of lobby conferences, which is a, an instance where the defense attorney and the prosecution will come in and say, Judge, we'd, ask, we, we'd like you to give this sentence. And the defense attorney says, no, Judge, we'd like you to give this sentence, and here's why. And so you, you, know, you have those lobbies. And then there are a lot of um, pleas. So a lot of people are pleading guilty, and, and they are um, negotiated with the, with the Commonwealth, with the prosecutors, and their joint recommendations. Now, I don't have to accept a recommendation that's made, uh, but I typically do. Do you have to explain what, what your decision is and why? Uh, that's the best practice. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I try to uh, for a few reasons. Um, if it's on the record, people, I think you, I think you owe it both to the public, the taxpayer, the defendant, and the prosecutor to explain why you're doing something. Um, so I start from that premise. But then also, if down the road there's a question, well, South Beach sentenced some, you know, someone to this. I mean, what a lunatic. Um, you can always go back to that record and see and hear the reasons why uh, that was done. And I think that that's helpful too. Um, and you don't want people to think that you're just sentencing on a whim. Um, I don't think that that would serve anyone. So, so yes, I, uh, I try to explain all of my reasons uh, on the record the best I can. And I may do so a little bit more um, than others maybe, but there are others that write a lot. So we have these things called uh, detention hearings under 
particular statute where the Commonwealth asks that we hold somebody without bail because they're dangerous. Um, I make those decisions and I make written findings because I sort of have to on a, on a pro forma sheet. I mean, there's a sheet you sort of check off things. Um, and then I'll put on the record the reasons. I have colleagues um, that will actually write a decision out on that. And I have some that just use the, the sheet itself and really don't give much more explanation than the sheet. So it depends on the judge. Um, but I, I think it's important the best, the best you can to explain your reasons. You know? Yes? They're appointed for life, right? Yes. And these are all of our judges that are appointed for life. Yes. So I don't remember the cases, but what happens when a judge makes a decision that outrages the public so much? And there's been cases like that in Massachusetts. Sure. What consequences did they ever suffer? Well, I mean, this is an important question because it goes to the issue of judicial independence, right? Um, we are not a true, dem we're not a true democracy, right? We're a republic, we're a constitutional republic. That means that people have rights that are not popular with the public sometimes. And I would argue that because I'm appointed for life and um, because I don't have to concern myself with the fact that I may have a majority of people who don't like something voting me out of, out of office.
great. So I'm, I'm glad to have done it, and I'm happy to come back anytime. Perfect. I'm glad to and have a nice, well, you've had your, your um, you know, St. Patrick's Day lunch, but <laughs> is this it? No more St. Patrick's Day festivities? No more dancing. No more dancing. Irish. All right, thank you very much.